Open it with me back toward the end of your Bibles, back to 1 Timothy chapter 6, where we will be reading together in just a few moments. We are glad that you're here, and we want to use God's Word this evening as our guiding influence, and look at what He has to say about a, a very relevant issue. If you have paid any attention whatsoever to local news over the course of the last several weeks, really the course of the last several months, you have heard that this weekend is a big weekend for the west side of our city. Tens of thousands of people are expected tomorrow and Tuesday on the west side of the city uh, to come and and check out a brand new state-of-the-art casino. Roads have been widened. There have been more than one of you who have remarked over the course of the last several weeks that you've had to adjust the way that you get here or the amount of time that you provide from the west side because of the significant construction that is going on. The structure is complete, uh, but road work, I, I think the last I heard, is still scheduled to go on for a couple of years to accommodate the anticipated traffic on the west side of Columbus. What about gambling? How should we think about that as Christians, if we ought to think about it at all? I'd like to read with you, first of all, uh, some words from a historian, a theologian, Albert Moeller, that was published just a few months ago in light of uh, much uh, of the expansion of gambling in the country. He writes that the casino stands as the great and most visible monument to the massive scale of the gambling industrial complex in America. Just look across much of the American landscape and you will see the glaring and garish lights of the casinos that serve to attract gamblers. It was not always so. Indeed, for all but the last decade of the 20th century, casinos were basically non-existent, except for those found in the state of Nevada. All that changed when states began to license and draw revenue from casino gambling. As Earl L. Greenells of the University of Illinois has commented, most areas of America had no legal casino gambling before 1990. As a matter of fact, such establishments had been virtually eradicated in the previous century. Reynolds explains that casino gambling is, quote, the only available example of an industry that was criminalized and intentionally eradicated in one century and reintroduced from zero in the next. What happened? In the late 19th century, social reformers saw gambling as an insidious plague that wrecked families, promoted antisocial behavior, and threatened the moral character of the entire nation. Their efforts to remove or eradicate gambling gained momentum in the early decades of the 20th century. As Daniel Schwartz, an influential historian of gambling, explains, the reintroduction of gambling came as state governments sought to benefit financially from legalized gambling and thus to rationalize its new role within the culture. Schwartz explains that in the 1920s, but truly accelerating in the 1960s, state governments began to embrace gambling. At first, looking merely to replace existing illegal gambling, states soon moved into the business of promoting betting and wagering. Casinos were generally not the first form of gambling to be legalized. Instead, gambling advocates turned first to horse racing. As Schwartz explains, Raising, selling, and racing horses was a major economic activity that employed thousands and made millions. Legal betting then could be rationalized as a way to stimulate the growth of a racing industry that would return money to its investors, its employees, and the state. 
Then, as now, arguments for the legalization of casino gambling are often couched in terms of saving the horse industry or some similar sector of the economy. By the 1970s, various states had experimented with horse racing and lotteries, and at least some were eager to move into even more rewarding territory. Casinos. Soon, New Jersey joined Nevada as a destination for casinos, and a new class of casinos was developed, looking more like family resorts than the casinos of previous eras. Nevertheless, the business is the same. The goal of the casino is to entice customers to part with their money, and in the end, the house always wins. Behind all of this, you will find insatiable appetites. The insatiable appetite on the part of some individuals determined to gamble, and the insatiable appetite of state governments for revenue. These appetites feed on each other. States increasingly hard-pressed for tax revenues look to expand gambling as a way to solve budgetary impasses. Political pressures on the states lead to the fear that another state will rob that state of revenue attracting citizens across its borders. Once a state expands gambling, it quickly becomes dependent on whatever income might come through the games, the tracks, the lotteries, and eventually the casinos. Research leads to estimations that the introduction of casinos in a community will produce about $34 per adult per year. At the same, do- at the same time, gambling will exact a toll far greater, estimated at between $180 and $289 dollars per adult citizen per year. The casinos do usually produce income, but this income is canceled out by social costs. Marital breakup, the abandonment of children, psychological stress, loss of employment, and suicide. Interestingly enough, in the course of the last three days, I've had two of you who related to me that Two members of families here have committed suicide as a direct result of gambling debt. The article concludes, You can dress a casino up to look like a family resort. You can disguise a casino as a high-end hotel. Nevertheless, the casino remains what it is, an engine for capturing wealth from those who are enticed to enter. State governments that authorize casino gambling are also authorizing the fleecing of their own citizens. In the final analysis, the greatest danger posed by the casino is not anything that can be determined by economic analysis, because the greatest injury caused by gambling is not financial, it is moral. The worst aspect of the casino culture is not just that the state has decided to prey on its own citizens, but that it has decided to do so with gusto. The nationwide explosion of legal gambling may well be the most underrated dimension of America's moral crisis. The rise of the casino goes hand in hand with the collapse of character. Words of a theologian and historian. Eugene Christensen, in the annals of the American Academy of Political and Social Sciences, recently estimated that one-third, one-third of American money will move through the gambling industry in one way or another each year. One-third of the money in this country. I quote, Americans spend more on gambling than they did on health insurance, dentists, shoes, foreign travel, or household appliances last year. Is this a good idea? Does the Bible have anything to say about it? Granted, 
There isn't anywhere in the Bible where we are even going to find the word. We're not going to find a thou shalt not. And yet we don't find that for pornography. Yet we understand that there are commands and examples and wisdom and principles that very much apply. We're not going to find the word heroin in the Bible. But we understand that there are commands and examples and wisdom and principles that apply. And I would suggest to you that absolutely those commands and examples and wisdom and principles are there on this issue as well. I would suggest to you, number one, that gambling is spiritually suicidal. That's a strong word. But it comes from the sort of language that we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and the seventh verse of the chapter where Paul says, We brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. But those who desire to be rich, and let's just pause there for a moment. On March 30th of this year, one winning number was chosen in the United States-wide Mega Millions Lottery. One number worth more than half a billion dollars. Lottery agents in the 48 hours leading up to that Friday night selection, lottery agents sold 1.3 million tickets per hour. 1.3 million tickets per hour. For a total of 1.2 billion tickets sold. For one drawing. Sixty billion dollars a year in this country is spent on the lottery. More than five hundred dollars per American household. Does the Bible have anything to say about that? Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. In Ecclesiastes 5 and verse 10, He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? If time could allow this evening, I had probably a dozen tragic stories from the course of the last 50 years, men and women, and how their lives have been ruined by the gaining of immense wealth. Sweet is the sleep, on the other hand, of a laborer, whether he eats little or much, but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. Our Lord, if you turn in your Bibles back to the Gospel of Luke chapter 12, as you're turning back there, listen to him in Luke chapter 16 and the 13th verse of the chapter when he clearly lays out 
the choice that is involved here. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Now, I haven't been there, but my guess is those words aren't inscribed over the entrance of our new casino. Luke chapter 12 and the 16th verse of the chapter, Jesus told them a parable saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully, and he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, Drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, you won't find that as a popular inspirational text on the walls of our new assembly, or our new casino. But these are the words of God. This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. We spent a couple of months, several months ago, talking about how the Bible presents the stewardship of material possessions as a crucial issue of discipleship. Christians are those who recognize my possessions, my money is not my own. It is God's. I am a trustee. And trustees will be judged for the quality of their stewardship. I will give an account to my Creator who has entrusted the things that I have. We turn in our Bibles back to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, if you will. Gambling, with that in mind, I would suggest to you, is a kind of embezzlement. We are managers. We are stewards, according to the New Testament. And managers do not gamble with their master's money. All that I have belongs to God. All of it. Faithful trustees don't gamble with a trust fund of which they are stewards. They have no right. Jesus, in his parable of the talents, talked about how we will give an account and those who were faithful took what they had and they went and they worked. That is how disciples of Christ seek to provide for themselves. It is all over the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 12, Paul, from the standpoint of the apostles, says we labor, working with our own hands. Not just the apostles, but the apostles told, for instance, those Christians in Thessalonica, you are to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, much more taking from those around you. Mind your own affairs and work with your hands. As we instructed you to those in Ephesus, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he might have something not with which to gamble, but to share with anyone in need. I would suggest to you that the very idea of gambling is directly opposed to the work ethic of Scripture. A constant thread from Old to New Testaments is the dignity of honorable work 
and the proper reward for labor and industriousness. The worker is worthy of his hire and he is to be rewarded. But nearly from cover to cover, the lazy, the slothful, the unproductive man or woman is called out in Scripture. Why? Because there's a principle here and a principle that applies to this issue. It severs the dignity of work from the hope of financial gain. It offers hope of riches without labor, reward, without the dignity to which we are being called by our Creator. You turn in your Bibles to the wise book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 30. I would suggest to you in a very real way, gambling is a Fool's errand. Newsweek, the week after the historic lottery on March 30th, calculated up for us some interesting odds. Death by vending machine, 1 in 112 million. Apparently, on average, two Americans each year are crushed by a vending machine. Having identical quadruplets, one in 15 million. Becoming president of the United States, one in 10 million. Dying from a bee or a hornet or a wasp sting, one in 6.1 million. Dying from being left-handed. The article said it's a right-handed world and there's a fair number of left-handed people who die each year from using right-handed products incorrectly. One in 4.4 million. Becoming a movie star. One in 1.5 million. Dying in a plane crash. One in 1 million. Death by flesh-eating bacteria. One in 1 million. Getting struck by lightning. One in 1 million. Dying in a bathtub. One in 840,000. Dying in an on-the-job accident. One in 48,000. Dying by murder. One in 18,000. Dying in a car accident. One in 6,000. The odds of winning that lottery in March of this year were one in 176 million dollars. And yet the same article reported that an estimated one-third of Americans thinking winning, think that winning the lottery is, quote, the only way to become financially secure in the present economy. One in third Americans. To the tune of 1.2 billion tickets sold for a single drawing. 60 billion a year, more than $500 per, per American household. Wisdom, in Proverbs 30 and verse 8, praise. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Now that ought to get our attention. This is the prayer of wisdom. You want to pray wisely, pray to God. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 4, A slack hand causes poverty, but the hand of the diligent makes rich. You turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. The entire system, of course, is built on the necessity of most people losing. There were some very disappointed people on April 1st, 2012. A sizable portion of the population of this country was disappointed on April 1st. Think about what our Lord commanded at the 
foundation of everything in the law of Moses. You shall not covet. Your neighbor's house, your neighbor's wife, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them, the Spirit of God says, not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with Everything to enjoy. They are to do good. To be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. So that they may take hold of that which is truly life. If you turn in your Bibles with me back to Second Peter chapter 2. This, of course, the entire system is built on the necessity of most people losing and the very dark underbelly of the whole thing, of course, is how it ravages the poor. History documents this for us in many different ways. The International Business Times recently reported gambling supports and encourages yet another corrosive addiction that preys upon the greed and hopeless dreams of those trapped in poverty. Listen to this. The poor in the United States, and by poor this particular article defines that as those earning $13,000 or less per year. The poorest of the poor in this country. The poor in the United States spend an astounding 9% of their income on lottery tickets. Making this harmless gain, gain, a deeply regressive tax. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 19 speaks of those who believe the promise of freedom, but they themselves are slaves. I don't know if you've heard the commercials over and over and over again over the course of the last few weeks advertising our new casino. Have you noticed what's at the end? A state-sponsored toll-free number for gambling addictions. The Columbus Dispatch, just a few days ago this past week, led with this paragraph. Odds are good that Ohio will face new waves of problem gamblers in the next few years on top of the current estimated 250,000 who already suffer from the gambling bug in this state. In 2009, an amendment was passed to our state constitution regulating that 2% of all casino gross proceeds should go to the prevention and treatment of gambling addictions. They promise freedom. But they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person to that he is enslaved. Already enough of you have talked with me that if you think I'm making a mountain out of a molehill this evening, come talk to me and I'll, I'll direct you to a couple of your brothers and sisters and they can tell you from family first 
first-hand experience what we're talking about this evening. Galatians 2 and verse 10, Paul was asked by those influential apostles to remember the poor. James warns about dishonoring the poor. The Old Testament prophets proclaimed God's devastating judgment against those nations who devour the poor. The concentration of lottery ticket outlets in lower income neighborhoods across this country and this city is not an accident. Contrast that with love that is patient and kind, that does not envy or boast, is not arrogant, is not rude, does not insist on its own way, is not irritable, resentful, does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, even in the words of Jesus when it comes to our enemies. You turn in your Bibles with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. There is a better alternative here. There is a better alternative purely from a physical, civil point of view. A survey by Opinion Research Corporation last year for the Consumer Federation of America revealed one-fifth, 21% of the people surveyed in this country thought gambling was a practical way to accumulate wealth. That is teaching people to be fools. Purely from a physical point of view. If the $500 a year that on average all American households throw away on gambling, if that were invested... $500 a year in an index fund each year for 20 years, each family in this country would receive $24,000. The taxes on those earnings would not only support governments if anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for members of his household, he's denied the faith. And he's worse than an unbeliever. There have been countless households that have suffered exactly what the Spirit of God is warning against because of this harmless game. In 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7, the Spirit of God says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be self-controlled and sober-minded. Think for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve as good stewards of God's varied grace. Ecclesiastes 11, Rejoice, O young man, in your youth and let your heart Cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and the side of your eyes, but know that for all these things, God will bring you into judgment. Very quickly in Ephesians chapter 5, at least in my mind, maybe the, the clearest principle along these lines. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 3, Paul writes to those saints in Ephesus, Sexual immorality, don't even let it be named among you. Impurity, don't let it even be named among you. Or covetousness, greed, don't even let it be named among you as is proper for saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or 
covetous, that he is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. This is all really for our schools. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. The prayer of the psalmist was for God alone, O my soul, wait in silence. My hope is from Him. Very realistically, there are many people whose hopes are built on all sorts of things other than Him. Very realistically, there are so many people who are being taken advantage of whose hope is not in Him. This evening, we want to make sure that as we hear from Him, you understand the importance of putting your hope in Him. And in Him alone. We want to sing, Let Him have His way with thee. His way is that you would recognize just how serious sin is. How easily it separates you from Him. His way, His will for your life is that you would turn away from sin. Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. His will is that you would be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk in newness of life, and live for the remainder of your time on this earth with this template. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. Would you let Him have His way with you this evening? If as a child of God we can pray with you, for you this evening, if in any way we can help, would you let us know by coming to the front while we stand and sing?